about his theory of argument mapping, which I think is some of the most cutting edge stuff going on in the world right now. And he's also spending some time with us tomorrow during an open office hour. So uh, without further ado, please give a warm PLU welcome to uh, Steve Johnson. Uh, good evening, and thanks for having me here. I'm excited to get a chance to talk with you guys about this. Uh, I apologize for being late. Um, the driver of the car at one point was lost and pulled over on the side of the interstate while other traffic was rushing by us and uh, making me very nervous. But we eventually got here an hour late. You guys have been sitting here for an hour waiting for me, so I very much appreciate your patience. Um, it's kind of interesting because actually getting lost is a really good metaphor for the stuff I'm going to talk to you about tonight. Because the, the work that I'm doing with the argument mapping um, kind of grew out of confusion about what debate was uh, early on in my career, and particularly about how to teach debate effectively. Um, I first started coaching in Alaska doing NPDA debate. Um, so it was like BP, which I believe you guys are doing now. Um, like BP, it has multiple topics. Every round was a different topic. Uh, and I was struggling to find a way to teach students how to uh, encounter and unpack topics and plan for strategy in debate um, when the, we didn't have a set topic to work on. If you've ever done on-topic debate, which uses for a semester or an entire year uh, one theme or one topic, um, it's a lot easier to teach that because you have a common set of substance um, to work with for students and it's very easy to say you're going to talk about this idea first and then you're going to talk about that idea next and finally you'll talk about this idea and most debates kind of follow along that same line. It's relatively easy to teach but with a format of debate where there are different topics every round, some of which might be policy topics, some of which might be normative topics, some of which might be neither or both. Uh, it, it was really difficult to, to explain to students what it was they were supposed to be doing. And a lot of models exist for argument, but not a lot of models exist for argumentation. At least not a lot of models that help me teach students how to debate effectively. And so what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is kind of the product of, of about 25 years worth of coaching. Um, and it, it, it landed as a, uh, as a model for argumentation and a model for debating. Um, that I think works pretty well to explain to students what debate is, how debate works, um, what decisions you need to make about strategy, uh, and how you can track what the hell is going on in a debate, which I think is a big part of being successful uh, in debate. Um, but debates are complicated phenomena, right? As a communicative act, they're incredibly complex. Not only are you talking about uh, individuals who are employing a very imperfect medium of communication. Language by itself is, by definition, an imperfect medium of communication. It, it purports to be able to transfer thoughts that are in one person's head to another person's head by means of making the air vibrate. We think about that as a, as a phenomenon. It's ridiculous that we could ever contort and shape sound in such a way that we could express abstract ideas from one person's consciousness to another person's consciousness. That it works at all, that language functions at all, is an amazing thing. Um, but then you take that language and you apply it to uh, something that is controversial, where there are multiple perspectives on what this thing is. And most debates kind of boil down to these normative questions. Is this thing good or bad, right or wrong, just or unjust? And in that circumstance, because you've got multiple perspectives, you're now using an imperfect medium with two very, at least two very different competing conceptions of what the thing is you're describing. One side is saying that this thing is good, just, right. The other side is saying this thing is bad, unjust, or wrong. And so you've got these competing conceptions of what this thing is using this imperfect medium to describe it. And then you take that disagreement, that just general disagreement in the context of the controversy, and you plant it into a debate round, where now you have competitive priorities driving people. So now you have these imperatives that people are responding to to misrepresent or distort ideas, um, to uh, critique or to characterize opponents' arguments in ways that are probably weaker than the opponent intended them to be. So there's deliberate misrepresentation, whether, and I don't mean that as an ethical judgment. I mean, it's, I've committed my life to debate. I'd like to believe it's not the most unethical thing that you can do. But nonetheless, it is a fact of 
competition that one of the things that you want to do is to characterize your opponent's arguments in such a way that the judge believes they are less than what they are. So now you've got imperatives in operation that distort the differing perspectives that are competing, employing that imperfect medium of communication that's designed to transfer abstract concepts from one consciousness to another consciousness. So already you're talking about incredibly complex things. And then layer on top of that some of the idiosyncrasies of debate. Right? So now you've got not just two different perspectives, but you've got four different teams in a BP round, each of which is trying to compete with the other to be more successful. You've got people speaking at incredibly fast rates of speech, two, sometimes three times the normal conversational rate of speech uh, in an effort to get out as many arguments as they possibly can. And so in the midst of all of that complexity, to think that you could ever render a judgment is amazing to me. That you could ever sort through the information that's being transferred between people and render a judgment, render a meaningful judgment about the arguments that are being presented um, is amazing to me. But even more amazing than that is the fact that we can even understand what is happening. That blows my mind. Um, that, that you can, in the context of all of that complexity, gain some or glean some meaning from the arguments being exchanged by, by individuals um, is, is amazing to me because of the tens of thousands of words exchanged in a debate, um, you're supposed to find some meaning in the arguments that are being exchanged in ways that, uh, that indicate to you which team should be first, second, third, and fourth. To, to do that requires that you know what's going on. Even, even to get to the point where you can make a judgment about who's making better arguments requires that you have an idea of what's going on. Uh, and I would venture to say, and I'll ask this in the form of a question, I'd venture to say that like me, many of you have spent a lot of time in debate rounds asking yourself what the hell is going on, right? I mean, that's a pretty, uh, the number of heads that are currently nodding suggests that that is not an atypical response to debates. And that isn't, by the way, exclusive to people who are brand new to debate. Justin, I'm sure, Angie, I'm sure, will affirm these notions that there are plenty of times you sit in the back of a debate round and you're asking yourself, what is happening here now? And part of that, of course, is explained by the complexity of the communication act in which you're engaged, explained by the shortcomings of the medium of communication that you're employing, explained by the competing imperatives and the uh, effort to, to, to uh, prevail over opponents. Part of it is explained by that, but part of it is explained because we're just not very well equipped as human beings to make sense of all of that stuff, right? So what I'm gonna talk to you about tonight is a solution to that problem that I found works pretty well, um, that, that gives uh, what, what I guess could be considered a common language or a common model for understanding what's going on in debate. Um, that I think applies to any debate round and, and, and arguably even beyond debate rounds to explain what's occurring in controversies and how understanding sort of the, what I call the spaces and places of argument um, can improve the quality of your understanding of that, that phenomenon, can, can improve the, the contributions that you can make to that process, um, and, in, and in stark debate terms can, can improve the chance that you're gonna win, which I think is a good thing. So where does this all start? It starts with this observation uh, that I kind of stumbled on a number of years ago um, that is related to the language that we use to talk about debate. Uh, if you've taken communication classes, um, you've probably encountered at some point uh, a couple of theorists, uh, uh, Lakoff and Johnson, who wrote a really terrific book um, about 30 years ago now called Metaphors We Live By. Um, and it was this groundbreaking book of, of cognitive linguistics um, that made the argument uh, that much of human thought is metaphoric, that the way that we encounter the world um, is to make associations between what we are encountering anew with what we already know. And Lakoff and Johnson wrote a great deal about this, um, particularly with regard to the study of the, the actual linguistic metaphors that we use. And they said that if, you, that if you study the metaphors that we use to talk about things, you gain a lot of insight into the things that we're talking about, because we not only express ourselves metaphorically, goes their argument, but those metaphors that we use to express ourselves actually reveal a great deal about our cognition, about how we think about things. Uh, and their, their, their example, one of the more, more famous examples, is the, the use of the war metaphor. Um, and everybody knows what war is, right? It's that fundamental human act of conflict where we invoke violence as a means of resolving disputes between people. Um, but they were interested in how we talked about war in other contexts as well. And they used examples like 
the war on drugs and the war on poverty. And they said that using that metaphor to explain those public policy problems that we're trying to address reveals a great deal about how we think about those things. Probably familiar with the war on drugs as, as a good example, that if we create this public policy problem as a war to be fought, then you have to have enemies against whom to fight. You have to have tactics to engage those enemies. You have to have battles in which those tactics are deployed, and you have to have victors and losers in those circumstances as well. And their argument, of course, if you play it out to its full logical conclusion, is it's a pretty damn poor metaphor for dealing with people who are suffering the trauma of drug addiction, that you shouldn't go to war against them. But that's the metaphor that we use, and it reveals how we think about those problems. The same thing is true with the war on poverty that was fought much earlier than the war on drugs. By essentially problematizing poverty, by making poverty not a, a plight to be alleviated, but rather an, a, an enemy to be fought, you kind of construct those people who are in poverty as either victims of that struggle or perhaps even enemies against whom to be fought. So you reveal a great deal about how you think about those things and the metaphors that we use. Well, I started noticing that the language that we use to talk about metaphor, or excuse me, the language that we use to talk about argument has a pretty persistent metaphor that shows up a lot as well. And that metaphor is the metaphor of movement. So we always are talking about, we're often talking about movement whenever we're talking about argument and argumentation. And we use phrases like advancing positions or swaying audiences, redirecting questioning, following lines of argument, taking logical leaps, etc., etc., etc. If you talk at all about argument, it's very difficult <coughs> to talk about argument or argumentation without using these metaphors of movement. Well, this got me thinking that there's probably something going on there familiar with Lakoff and Johnson's cognitive metaphor theory, it became clear to me that there's probably something underlying that notion of how we think about argument that goes just beyond abstractions. Because as abstractions, arguments don't move. Right? I mean, they're abstractions. They have no physical form. They're not tangible. They're not concrete. You can't pick up an argument and set it down somewhere else. You can't manipulate an argument in the ways that you would manipulate a table or a chair or a pen or a water bottle or what have you. It doesn't have that physical form. So why is it that we use this metaphor of movement, this language that reveals this notion that we conceive of these things as tangible whenever we're talking about argument or argumentation? Well, the answer to this question kind of goes back quite a ways, actually. Um, and to explain it, you got to kind of back up a ways with me to understand uh, a broad perspective on, on what we know about human consciousness. So here's what we generally know about human consciousness. Um, it, it isn't really easily explained, not only as a phenomenon, most people are generally familiar with that, but even our, even our best cognitive science at this point does not know a great deal about human consciousness, about what it is that makes humans able to think, that makes them self-aware, that makes them capable of understanding abstract thought. But some of the things that we do know about consciousness are that it emerged very rapidly. That right at the end of the, the Pliocene era, about 2.5 million years ago, there was this sudden explosion uh, of human activity that is related only to an explanation that, that is grounded in consciousness. We started doing things that only conscious beings could do. Right? We started organizing ourselves into social units. We started using tools. We started employing uh, those tools to manipulate the environment in which we live, uh, to increase our chances of survival. We started domesticating livestock and all this kind of stuff that wouldn't be explainable but for our ability to think uh, about ourselves and our place in the world. But the confusing thing was that human consciousness emerged so quickly that there wasn't really a convenient evolutionary explanation for it. Obviously, it had evolutionary advantages to be conscious, to be able to think about the world and plan the world uh, and manipulate the world around you from a conscious perspective makes a whole lot of sense evolutionarily. What doesn't make sense evolutionarily is how we got there so quickly. The scale of evolutionary time, the ability to develop things like sight organs or hearing or even digits that can manipulate the world around you, I mean, that's the product of millions of years of subtle changes and accidents and preferences and evolutionary imperatives that are being responded to over a long scale of time. The emergence of consciousness is a blink of the eye in evolutionary terms. It happened that quickly. So there's been a lot of evolutionary biologists who've been working on this question of how did it come to pass so quickly. And one of the more influential evolutionary biologists is a guy known as Stephen Gould. Uh, 
um, who wrote in the early 80s um, about something he called exaptation. And his, his theory was this, that sometimes there are evolutionary accidents where certain attributes emerge because they're responding to evolutionary pressures. And it's just by happenstance that sometimes those evolutionary adaptations become used for purposes other than they were intended. His famous example is feathers on birds. And the theory that he made really famous was that feathers, as they emerged for birds, did not emerge because birds needed to fly. They emerged on reptiles, dinosaurs, late stage dinosaurs, um, not as instruments of flight, but rather as instruments of cooling the body. And so the feathers were designed to move air around the body in such a way that the reptile could cool itself more efficiently. And it just happened that after they had evolved feathers, I don't know, some one dinosaur jumped off a cliff and evaded a predator, was able to spread their genetic heritage forward perhaps, but it, it, it became that those cooling instruments, the feathers that those early dino or late dinosaurs had, um, worked really well for helping those dinosaurs fly. And so rather than adaptation, which is a specific response to an evolutionary pressure, he called this exaptation, where you co-opt something else, a different, a, 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 an evolutionary response that has been developed in the context of a specific thing, but it's used for some other purpose. It's exapted for some other purpose. Back to the question of consciousness. One of the things that we recognize when talking about consciousness is that the crown jewel of human consciousness is rationality, the ability to reason, that we elevate as a uniquely human phenomenon this, this notion of, of putting together abstract concepts, seeing relationships between abstract concepts, or even for that matter, the ability to abstract period, to think about the future, to project into years far ahead of us or even moments far ahead of us, to to recall the past and our story and our history in the past, to think about things that have never existed. Right? These are amazing powers that human beings have that are all connected to this ability to reason, to see connections between things that otherwise wouldn't exist. Well, using this theory of exaptation that came from Stephen Gold, um, there's a cognitive linguist um, named uh, Daniel Castasanto um, who proposed that what happened with reasoning was not that human beings responding to evolutionary pressures evolved the ability to reason. Again, remember consciousness emerged very quickly in the course of human history. Um, he said instead what seems to have happened is that we have exacted other prototypical or, or proto-developmental psychological mechanisms and applied them to purposes that they were never intended to apply to. Well, one of the things that is a very basic matter of cognition for any creature that wants to survive is spatial reasoning. Knowing where the food is, knowing where potential sexual partners are, uh, knowing where danger is and how to get away from danger is a pretty convenient evolutionary imperative. Right? It's pretty important to be able to know where those things are and how to get to them. And so just about every creature that we study has a pretty advanced degree, or every creature that has mobility, has a pretty advanced degree of spatial reasoning. They can understand the world around them, they understand how to move in that world, and they understand how to accomplish certain things relative to the space around them. It's a very well-developed psychological mechanism that just about every creature that moves in the world has. Casasanto's theory was that we took that spatial reasoning capacity that we have, that very well-developed and very old psychological mechanism that we had as human beings, and transferred that psychological mechanism to apply to abstract thought. That what we do is we tend to think about abstractions in very concrete terms. That even though those abstractions don't have physical form, don't have tangibility, we still conceive of them as if they do. And his study was particularly about time. And time is a great example of this because if you start thinking about time, you'll start to quickly realize that the language we use to talk about time is very physical in its nature, even though time is perhaps the ultimate abstraction, right? But we talk about long and short when we talk about time. Um, we talk about uh, uh, the, the places related to time and, 
and durations of time, and all of these things sort of have this, this physicality. That's what, that's what Casasanta was, was discussing in his research. And so when I discovered this sort of approach to it, it brought me back to this question of why we might use all these metaphors of movement to talk about argument and argumentation. And, and my hunch, my theory, if you will, is that the same sort of explanation for uh, how we engage in abstract reasoning by appropriating the mechanisms of spatial reasoning um, apply not only to our conceptions of time, but apply particularly to conceptions of argument and argumentation. That we use spatial reasoning in ways that we don't fully understand to, in, to engage the process <coughs> of abstract reasoning. I'm so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> We're talking about places you can wander around and pick up that thing which is not now in its place that it's supposed to be. So what does that tell us? So if we, if we buy this premise, right, if we buy this notion that abstract reasoning is really just spatial reasoning in a different form, what does that tell us about argumentation? And I, and I had begun to think about that in ways that I think um, produce some, some insights into how we think about reasoning, how we engage in abstract reasoning, how we engage in argumentation, and that if we kind of work backwards and deconstruct, we can actually develop a model of argumentation based upon spatial reasoning that helps us understand what the hell is happening in that complex phenomenon of debate. So here's what it kind of looks like. Start with some assumptions. So the simple model of argument, most people have probably encountered this if you've been in debate for a week or two. Your coach has probably talked to you about the most basic model of argument, right? It employs an assertion grounded in evidence through which or pro from which a reasoning process moves an audience. So we believe generally that an audience accepts the evidence that we're likely to use um, to ground our assertion. The goal of that argument is to get the audience to move to accept the assertion that we want them to believe. And the process by which we move them from one point to another is this process of reasoning. So we present one idea as a proposition. I'd like you to believe this. We offer something else as evidence. I trust you already believe this thing. And we encourage you to use your reasoning to move from one place to the other, from the acceptance of that evidence to the acceptance of the assertion. So already we see this notion that in the very basic models of argument that we employ, that there is this notion of movement present in them as well. So if, for example, you were making the argument that smoking should be banned, you might offer as evidence for that that smoking poses a significant public health risk. And you ask your audience through the process of inference or process of reasoning, to make a connection between their belief that smoking poses a, a public health risk to accept the belief or to accept the proposition that smoking should be banned. That reasoning process works generally pretty well for the arguments that we make, but we explain that often by using this notion of moving. But if we extrapolate beyond that, and ask ourselves, what does this metaphor of movement tell us about argumentation in general, or tell us about arguments in general? There are a couple of assumptions that we can kind of discover that tell us about how we think about the space and the place in which argument occurs. So the first assumption is this, that in order for us to conceive of arguments as if they are concrete and not mere abstractions, we think about arguments, we conceive of arguments as if they have form that they have the same sort of form that a water bottle or a table or a chair or anything else that's tangible and concrete in the world has. So we assume that they have features, elements, dimensions, valence, texture. We assume that the form that those arguments have provides them with definition and context. Definition is that if there are boundaries between that thing and other things. It is defined in some way. And that definition provides us the ability to recognize that thing, in this case that argument, separate from the context in which it occurs. That is the space in which that argument might exist. We also know, so, so hold on to that assumption for just, for just a second, and let's talk about argument. If argument is the space within which arguments are exchanged, right, that place that we use to exchange arguments, then there are a couple of things we can know about that too that that space will have some boundaries. That when we talk about the process of argumentation and argumentation on a particular topic, we know that one of the functions of that topic is to provide the boundaries for that, those arguments. If, for example, we're arguing about whether or not uh, we should withdraw troops from Afghanistan, 
we know that the boundaries around the argumentation, the space within which the argumentation is going to occur, the space within which arguments are going to be exchanged, is going to exclude arguments about whether or not we should have socialized medicine, or whether or not we should uh, limit the influence of Facebook in the public sphere. Right? Those are arguments that are probably irrelevant to the question of whether or not we should withdraw troops from <coughs> Afghanistan. We know that there is a boundary around this space within which our arguments are going to occur. We also know that the goal of argumentation is to capture the audience's attention. That what we want to do is to have them believe our arguments more than our opponent's arguments. That when we're exchanging arguments with an opponent, we are doing so in the effort to try and get them to believe us more than they believe our opponent. And one of the ways that we can conceive of that is that we're trying to attract their attention more than the attention they're willing to give to our opponent. Whoever has the most attention at the end of the round, ostensibly, would win. A basic analogy for this is a field of play, right? That we can think of this space then within which argumentation occurs because it has a boundary around it, because it is comprised of this attention that we're contesting between ourselves and the other side, we can see that this is a field of play within which the contest or the, the within which the arguments that we use to contest that audience's attention uh, are, are, are featured. So this is a really exciting slide. But think of this as the playing field, right? That if this is the audience's attention, then this is the field on which these controversies are contested. It has those boundaries. It defines what is relevant from what's not relevant. And if we conceive of it as attention, then it makes sense to talk about how we might contest that argument, how make those arguments might interact. Going a little further into this question of places and spaces, one of the ways that we mark a place in a debate is to look for points of clash. We look for those points where arguments from one side interact with arguments from the other side. Because those places are very relevant to us. Anybody's ever judged a debate round, or anybody's ever participated in a debate round, or engaged in any argumentation at all, know that the most satisfying exchanges that you can have are when one side says yes to argument A, and the other side says no to argument A, and there's interaction between those arguments. That point of clash is a really important part of the argument. So we know that these are imagined places where competing arguments interact, and we can identify a couple of those imagined places that are relevant to this discussion. The first is the proposition, which is the major point of clash in the debate, also known as the motion, the topic, uh, the proposition. Um, we know that that is the dividing line between what those in favor are going to say and what those against are going to say. So if we go back to our field of play on which arguments occur, we know that points of clash are going to divide that field of play between the pro side and the con side. They're going to divide the field of play between the potential areas that the pro side could make arguments and the potential areas where the con side could make arguments. And that dividing line between the two, that dividing line between pro and con, functions as that that point of clash between proposition and opposition, where we'd expect their arguments to meet ours, pro arguments to meet con arguments. We can go even further and say this is represented by a tension that exists between pro and con, that they have competing goals, that pro wants to prove the proposition true, con wants to prove the proposition false, and that is represented by this force that is exerted upon this point of clash as they push back and forth in an effort to gain more or less attention from the audience. So it's this constant tension that exists on this point of clash, represented by these arrows, that recognizes that effort made by both sides to achieve the greater amount of attention or to capture the greater amount of, of attention from one side or the other um, in the minds of the audience. So that's the first assumption, that arguments occur in a particular place, that, that argumentation is itself a place where arguments can be exchanged and that place has boundaries, it's divided between pro and con, it's the place where force is exerted between pro and con, that makes sense. But there's a second point of clash. The point of clash is that the, the second point of clash, that second communication interaction to one that is discernible and accessible um, and intelligible to an audience and to the participants in that process. But there's even more that the model can tell us. So the second broad assumption underpinning this notion that argumentation is movement is this assumption, that if 
arguments exist, if they have tangible form, which was that first assumption that we explored, uh, if they have tangible form, then we know that they exist in space. We talked about the space both of the territory of argumentation as well as the space defined by the issues within that territory of argumentation. But the second assumption that emerges here is that their existence in space permits them to interact. Because we conceive of them as discrete, tangible objects that are defined in ways different from their context, then they also must be able to interact with other discrete, tangible objects that are defined in ways that make them interact in that context as well. That existence, that, that manipulability, that ability to, to move arguments around, to change the motion and direction of arguments, to influence how those arguments interact with one another, not only influences the arguments themselves, but can influence that space within which the arguments occur. So a couple important things come from this assumption there. The first is talking about the kinds of movements that happen in debate. And the first kind of movement that I, that I talk about is the, the movement of distribution, which is the allocation of space or attention within an issue based upon the arguments exchanged by the pro and con side. Now remember, we're talking about the mind of the audience. So as a persuasive effort, I'm trying to influence the space in your mind by making arguments that apply force to that space. Well, at the same time, the opposition responds by applying force to that space as well, trying to accumulate or, or capture more of that space as well. So when we're talking about distribution, the forces of argumentation move those spaces like this. So as the pro side makes arguments in issue number one, we see that line move further, oops, further to the right. As the con side makes arguments, it moves further to the left, and they gain or lose ground based upon whether or not the argument is compelling or is not compelling to the audience, whether or not the, argue, the audience is willing to give attention to and acceptance to that argument or not. I call this distribution because it's the distribution of ground, how we distribute that ground within the debate, how we distribute that attention within the, deb the debate based upon the, the exertion of force on those points of clash in an effort to move that line left or right uh, in the context of making those arguments, in the context of achieving that goal. The second type of movement that occurs that is relevant is displacement. Displacement occurs when the size of an issue increases or decreases in response to the pressure that arguments place on that space. So as you make arguments about one issue being more important than another issue, you're going to see that those issues expand in importance. And because we assume that the potential area of argumentation is a fixed territory, as one issue expands, other issues contract. That looks something like this. That as one issue becomes increasingly important, it puts pressure on other issues to become significantly less important. Now remember, this is happening in the mind of the audience, right? This isn't something that you can measure objectively, but you can understand this as a goal, but one of the things that you want to do is to apply pressure not only to capture ground within an issue in that distributed fashion, but also to capture ground between issues such that the issues you find most important displace those other issues that the other side might find more important. And if this is done well, if this is done consistently and with attention, strategic attention throughout a debate, at the end of a debate, you might end up, a debate, for example, on tobacco products, it begins with this set of issues that are going to be explored. You end up with a debate at the, or the map of that territory at the end that might look something like this. And the thing that I always find really interesting about this is that even without having heard the arguments, even without having any idea of what occurred in the debate round, you can construct a pretty good story of what's going on here. The first question I'd ask is who won this debate, pro or con? Yeah. Why do you know the pro won? because they occupy more space, right? The, at the end of the day, if the goal is to occupy the most territory, it's obvious that the pro side occupied more territory than the con side. And this is interesting because they lost a majority of the issues. Both the uh, second and third issues, in terms of distribution of space within the issue, um, were clearly won by the con side. But that they occupy more space asks the question not only who won each issue, but also which issue is most important. So what kind of arguments do you think produce this map of the territory of that debate? What kind of things were said in the debate that would make the map look like this at the end of the debate? 
what are they talking about in the debate room? Yeah. You would need to prove why a public health concern is the most important thing that we're dealing with. <coughs> we can talk about that because it affects the most amount of people or it's like the most severe of punishments that society can endure. Sure. I mean, it, in this round, clearly what happened is even though the pro side lost on the question of whether or not a ban will deprive tobacco users of their rights, and they lost on the question of whether or not there will be significant economic consequences, they were able to convince the audience not only that there will be, ideally, improvements in public health, but that those improvements in public health are far more important than the rights or the economic questions posed in the other issues. They're not only winning on a, an issue, they're winning, they're, they're convincing the audience that that issue is the most important of the issues discussed in the debate. So what does this tell you about what you have to do in a debate? Well, fundamentally it tells you that you have to pay attention not only to winning particular issues, but you also have to pay attention to proving to your audience that those issues are the most important issues that are, that are being discussed. So, at this point I want to make sure that all of this stuff makes sense so far, yeah? Okay. A couple other things that we can talk about. First of all, the, the modes of argumentation, the basic skills of argument, um, are things with which probably all of you are familiar, but I want to try and talk about these four different skills that I think are foundational skills for debaters, and then correlate them to this model of argumentation and how this model of argumentation explains what you are supposed to be doing in each of those skills. So, four basic skills. First of all, there's definitional argumentation. You have a responsibility as a debater um, to define the boundaries of the controversy by defining the terms of that controversy. So, if you're on proposition, this means literally offering definitions of some of the terms of the topic that you're debating. If, for example, you're debating about removing troops from Afghanistan, one of the things that you would want to make clear is, by when? And what would the post-withdrawal model for Afghanistan look like? Right? Because those definitions provide us with clarity on what it is we're going to be agreeing or disagreeing about. There might be pushback from the opposition. They might, at times, say that your definitions are too vague. They might say that you've misunderstood what the real controversy is about. But we know that there are times when we will have definitional debates. We also know that constructive argumentation is an important basic skill. That is, the ability to build arguments is an important part of what it takes to be a successful debater. To introduce new arguments and, and to develop those arguments, to provide those arguments with the substantiation, the evidence, and the implied inference that would connect that evidence to the conclusion um, is part of what constructive argumentation has to be. It's an important ability, an important skill that debaters have to do. Deconstructive argumentation is also one of the very basic skills. Critiquing the arguments of your opposition, demonstrating the weaknesses and shortcomings of those arguments, demonstrating the flaws in evidence or the flaws in logic um, in those arguments that make them weaker than the opposition would like the audience to believe they are. We know that to be a successful debater, you must also engage in deconstructive argumentation, the taking apart of your opponent's argument. And finally, there's comparative argumentation. That is evaluating the relative merits of competing positions. That part of what you have to be able to do as a debater is to explain to an audience why one position, if true, is still more important, significant, compelling than another position, if true. Those evaluative efforts on your part are, are an important part of what, ex what, what successful debaters have to be able to do. But if we were to place these into a hierarchy, they'd look something like this. The most basic skills are definitional skills, being able to tell us what things mean and what arguments are about, what the territory of argumentation is going to be. And then, from there, you should be able to construct arguments on behalf of that thing that you've defined, for or against the thing that you've been charged with defining. A more refined and difficult to grasp skill is the deconstructive effort, that is, to address the weaknesses and shortcomings of opponents' arguments, and at the top of the hierarchy, then, the most difficult skill to obtain is the comparative effort. Now, not only are the, is this hierarchy instructive of the difficulty of exercising these skills, it's also revelatory of the better quality of debates, right? Have you ever been involved in a debate that is all about the definitions? They're terrible, right? I mean, they're frustrating, they're boring, they're crazy-making debates. 
You've certainly been in debates where both sides do nothing but build arguments, right? Where one side says one thing, the other side says the other thing, and the never, two never interact with one another. Not so good a debate. Deconstructive debates are at least a little better. They're addressing the opponent's positions, telling me why the opponent is not succeeding or should not be believed. Best debates are comparative debates. Those debates where both sides are willing to make concessions. What they say is true, but here's why our side is still more important. And so there's actually that sort of hierarchical relationship between what makes a good debate and a bad debate. My contention is if you understand the physicality of debates, the spaces and places of argumentation, you're much more likely to get a comparative argumentation than if you don't. Because these skills are correlated in a pretty relatively straightforward way. Definitional debates are all about establishing boundaries. Right? All about telling us where are we debating? What are the terms of the motion? What defines proposition ground from opposition ground? What are we going to disagree about? The best debates, the best debates are never about disagreements. They're about agreements. They at least start with agreements. Agreements on what we're going to disagree about is an incredibly important part of it. So being able to define well, to establish the boundaries of, deba of a debate is an important first step. This motion of distribution comprises that constructive and deconstructive effort. So what we're doing now is advancing arguments in the constructive phase or, or in constructive argumentation that will establish what these issues are, that will define the boundaries of these issues. In our debate about smoking, why was there an issue about whether or not a ban would compromise tobacco users' rights? Why did that issue emerge? Where did it come from? <coughs> Where did any issues come from? Real world issues? What's that? Real world policy debates? Yeah, but I'm asking a more specific question. That certainly they mirror real world <laughs> policy debates. In the debate round that we watched, we saw that map of the debate at the end. We pretended like we watched the debate, and that's what the map looked like. There was an issue that had to do with smokers' rights, whether or not smokers or, or tobacco users' rights would be violated if we banned them. My question is, in that debate, why did that issue emerge? Someone made the argument? Yeah, issues come from arguments, right? If the, pro if the opposition never said anything about whether or not smokers' rights would be violated by a ban, that issue would never emerge. There'd be no reason for the proposition to address that, because it's not advantageous to them to argue that rights won't be compromised if the other side hasn't said the rights will be compromised. So when we're talking about constructive argumentation, we're talking about literally defining the issues within the territory of argument. When I make my constructive argument, when I advance a new position, when I introduce a, an argument to the round, I'm inviting an issue. I'm saying, hey, opposition, meet me on this territory. Direct your de deconstructive effort here. And when we engage in that deconstructive effort, then we're engaged in that process of distribution, of pushing back and forth on that line within that issue trying to gain the most attention, gain the most ground within that issue. But finally, the most important part of it is that evaluative argument is this displacement effort. That when you're saying this issue is more important than that issue, public health is a far more important concern than the economic consequences or the deprivation of rights that might be manifest because we ban tobacco products. When you're making those sorts of arguments, you're making that distributive effort. You're applying force to that space of argumentation in an effort to convince your audience that that issue is the most important issue in the round, and insofar as that issue is more important than others, you're saying that this should occupy more of your attention when you're making the decision. To your audience, you're explaining to them how they should map the mental territory of that argument in ways that are advantageous to you. So that's how the relationship between those basic skills of argument and the movement model correlate. Make sense? So the final thing I want to talk about is this. Argumentative proprioception. Anybody know what proprioception is? Balance. What's proprioception? Balance. It's what? Your sense of balance. Uh, it includes your sense of balance, yes. That's certainly an important part of it. But it even goes beyond that. Here's an easy way to, you're, you're, you got it. An easy way to know what proprioception is. Close your eyes. Everybody just try it. Close your eyes. Stick your hand up. Touch your nose. Now you know what proprioception is. The ability to know where your body is in space is proprioception. It's one of the six senses, there are a whole bunch of six senses beyond the basic five. That's one of the important six senses that we have. It has to do with balance. 
but it also has to do with knowing what your body is doing and where your body is in space when you don't observe it or when you can't observe it. It would be really inconvenient if every time you wanted to do something with your hands, you had to make a visual model of where your hands should be and then move your hands to that place. Proprioception is what allows us to play piano, uh, allows us to play video games, what allows us to walk, right? All of those things that we can do because we have an inherent sense of where things are without having to think about where those things are. I think successful debaters need to develop argumentative proprioception. They need to understand the place and the space of the arguments that they make within the argumentation acts that they exchange with others. And I think that there are five important subsets of proprioception, five important kind of skills. Think of proprioception as a suite of skills um, that you have to have as a debater in order to be successful. The first of those skills uh, is establishing the boundaries of the controversy. So one of the things that you have to be able to do well as a debater is to be able to establish the bounds of the controversy. And this, by establish, I also mean to contest. There are times when it's appropriate for you to direct your energies to contesting the bounds of the controversy, claiming that the proposition misunderstood or misrepresented the bounds of that controversy. Understanding the space within which that argumentation is going to occur is an important part, a first important part of that proprioception, knowing where arguments are happening and where your arguments fit in that space of argumentation. A second, well, the second, third, and fourth sub-skills of proprioception. The second important part of proprioception has to do with identifying points of clash. That is to be able to listen to your opponent's arguments, or if you are an audience to an argumentation, to listen to the arguments being exchanged and identify where those arguments interact with one another. To discern those points of clash is an important part of being able to respond effectively in that act of argumentation when exchanging arguments with others. Just knowing where to look, knowing where your efforts should be directed, or knowing where the efforts of the arguments that you're watching are being directed is an important part of proprioception as well, to be able to say that there is a point of clash, but there is no clash on this other question. It's an important part of it as well. A third subset or a third sub-skill in proprioception is the ability to phrase issues. And phrasing issues means that you express using appropriately abstracted language the issues such that they are inclusive of all the arguments you want them to contain and exclusive of arguments you don't want them to contain. So if we say, for example, uh, we're talking about rights of smokers, then we phrase that issue, we actually use wording to express that issue in ways that are inclusive of all potential arguments that could be made about tobacco users' rights. It's not so broadly phrased that it includes way more than just questions about rights, like, will this ban be good for tobacco users? Okay, that's a poorly phrased issue because it's so broad as to be meaningless. On the other hand, you don't want to phrase it so narrowly that it becomes almost irrelevant. You don't want to say, for example, um, will Bob, the smoker who lives on 121st Street, still have the right to go down to the uh, quick stop and buy a pack of Marlboros? Right? That's a far too narrow phrasing of that motion. An appropriate abstraction would be somewhere in the middle. Will a ban compromise smokers' individual rights? That's an appropriate phrasing of that. It's appropriate size for that issue. It includes enough and excludes irrelevant things such that you have phrased a good issue that is functional for capturing and focusing the argument so that they can interact on those points of clash. A third important part of argumentative proprioception, or sorry, a fourth important part of argumentative proprioception is sequencing issues. Putting them in the right order, considering them in the right order, organizing them in such a way that they make sense and lead from one to the next. There's a certain logical progressivity to some questions, such that some issues are a priori to others. Some things have to be addressed before other things are addressed. Um, consider the motion uh, that the state should facilitate prisoners' rights to procreation. Interesting topic, right? We lock people up. And the question posed by this motion is, should the state be responsible for making sure those people who are incarcerated have the right to pass on their genetic heritage to the next generation, to their progeny. Lots of issues could be debated there, but let's say for the moment that we're going to unpack that. 
It seems that the very first question you could ask is whether or not a right to procreation exists at all. Whether or not human beings as individuals possess a right to procreation. That's not something that is well defined, not something that is broadly culturally accepted, but is something that is potentially worth arguing. The proposition for that motion, of course, would say all humans possess a right to procreation. The proposition might find purchase, in, or the opposition might find purchase in making arguments that human beings don't have an inherent right to procreation. If we establish that humans do have a right to procreation, then the next question we want to ask ourselves is do prisoners, as a subclass of humans, I don't mean self like, less respected, less valuable, but a smaller class of humans, do prisoners, as, as a subclass of all humanity, have a right to procreation? And then, from there, we might ask ourselves, assuming that the answer to that is yes, we might ask yourself, does the state have a duty to facilitate that right to procreation? There's an order in which those issues need to be addressed. You wouldn't ask yourself first, should the state facilitate the prisoner's rights before you'd establish whether or not prisoners even have those rights. And you wouldn't ask yourself if prisoners had those rights before you'd establish whether or not all of humanity has those rights. So sequencing issues, putting them in the right order, and addressing them in the right order such that you're constructing a logical decision, a logical path toward a decision. By the way, path, there's another spatial metaphor in argumentation. Creating that path to a conclusion for your audience is intuitive and easy for them to follow. So sequencing issues is an important part of argumentative proprioception as well. And finally, the fifth subskill, perhaps the most important one, is the strategy subskill. The, Learning about the space and place of argumentation helps you make decisions about where you can best apply force in your efforts to make arguments. Whether it should be in constructing arguments, that is defining new issues by introducing arguments that will demand the space within which those arguments occur. Whether you'd be best served by deconstructing other issues, that your opponents have created an issue by introducing an argument that merits or warrants or demands your response or whether you should direct your energy toward comparing arguments. This is the decision that you might make when you realize that you have probably diminished your opponent's arguments as much as you can, and it still probably has some valence with your audience. It probably still has some value with your audience. You now have to make a decision about how you demonstrate that the arguments you're winning are more important than the arguments you're losing. I think that this notion of argumentative proprioception built upon this model, this, this spatial model of argumentation, gives insight to, at least it, it has helped me teach people how to debate more effectively. Because I think it gives tangibility to what is an otherwise intangible, and as I noted earlier, extraordinary, extraordinarily complex communicative act. And my belief is if you spend time working on these issues, and you spend time developing this sense of argumentative proprioception, you will improve dramatically your ability to debate and your ability to win trophies in debating. And more importantly, it gives you just a great deal more uh, authority as an arguer because you'll be better able to manage those spaces within which you're exchanging your arguments. That's my pitch. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about the thinking I've done on this. <laughs> Questions, reaction, disagreement? I would love disagreement. <laughs> a good argument. What do you think of the argument as dance uh, theory? I don't know anything about the argument as dance theory. Tell yeah, me about it. Uh, well, okay, so I read the Blackhoff and Johnson, yeah. and he talks about the metaphors we live by, and there's like a whole section about like argument oh, as a dance, gotcha. as like, and it's like argument as war, it's like just as a different kind of movement, yeah. metaphorical movement, so he talks about like, how like you might like sidestep your partner or like sashay away from a, I don't know. Sure. It was a bunch of weird stuff, but I was just curious if you thought anything about that. I, I, I think it's uh, illustrative. Um, mm -hmm. I think they got it wrong. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I wouldn't be so arrogant as to say that accomplished linguists are not smart about that. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's illustrative, and, and any of these metaphors can be grouped by subcategory, right? But but still, in using the metaphor of dance to speak about argumentation, you're still talking about space, right? Dance occurs in space. They're talking about sidestepping arguments or sashaying yeah. away from positions. They're still talking about space. And so I would say that perhaps, while that is a subset of a particular kind of argument or argumentative strategy, I think mine is still more universal.
beyond just using the spatial like strategy is integrating this type of spatial language and description like more rhetorically effective because it like like provides a more like physical mm. like manifestation of it like I, I don't know like yeah it's an excellent question it's a terrific question because what you're uh, what I think you're fundamentally asking is the same question uh, the Casa Santo ends his this terrific article. I can refer to it if you want to. But the same question he ends his article with, which is to say, I am not to sure yet whether these things exist in everybody's brain, or if this is just a really convenient way of, for me to explain what exists in my brain and to encourage you to think about it the same way. Um, I don't know, right? I think what is uh, what what seems plausible to me. Uh, and what I believe is universal is this notion that we do employ spatial reason um, in the service of abstract reason. So everybody, I think, thinks spatially, whether they know it or not, they think spatially about arguments. I think what this does is it presents one model of what that might look like. I have no idea what's going on in your head or the heads of the other 20 people in this room. But this is what it looks like in my head. And if I can use this language to paint for you that same picture such that we share a, 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 a common model of what argumentation looks like, then we improve dramatically our ability to communicate effectively. Because really, that's all communication is, right? This is the way I interpret this symbol. You should interpret it the same way. I've just given you a complex symbol that I'm hoping you can interpret. So yes, I would strongly encourage you to use this language to build these models in your audience's mind such that they can track your argument more effectively. I know that my debaters regularly use the language and the model of this language when we talk about and watch and, and engage in debates, because this is what debate looks like to us. And by the way, they weren't at all happy that I was coming out here to talk to you. <laughs> you going to talk to them? Why would you do that? So use it to beat Alaska debaters. That makes me happy. <laughs> yes? I was just kind of wondering how this relates to like people flowing during a round and like mm. where you're going to sound like you're going to get the tape on paper. Does yeah. that have anything to do with it? It has everything to do with it. Right? I think it has everything to do with it. Um, the frustrating thing is because flowing is this kind of linear model that is on a very static medium of paper and ink, you can't adjust things retroactively. Right? What I've, what I've proposed is actually for for the next academic year, I proposed a sabbatical where I would develop a digital model of this that would be manipulable on like a phone or a computer or a, or a tablet, so that as the debate is progressing, you could start drawing these things and adjusting them and moving them around and recording arguments in particular spaces. So could it work as a flowing model? Sure. But I think you're asking a more fundamental question, which is, is there some relationship between the recording of a debate on paper and this mental model of the debate, right? Mm -hmm. I think there, there certainly is for me. Right? I got pre-printed flow paper. Every debate looks the same on my flows, right? Pre-printed flow paper, eight different qua or eight different categories, spaces of argument, right? Um, and I, I flow everybody's speeches in the same place, but what that has developed for me over the years is that I not only think of that as the paper record of the flow, but it also kind of is the physical manifestation of how I'm thinking about the debate and the relationships between them and the key points at which a debate needs to turn and the divisions between proposition and opposition in first half and second half. And all of those things are intimately related between what I'm recreating on paper and what's actually happening in my mind. So I think it is instructive because, and, and I watch, it drives me crazy to watch people who just flow on in paragraph form Right? They'll flow this person's thing, and then they'll flow the next person's thing. It's like, how do you make the arguments interrelate like that? And old school people, Justin will tell you this, right? the flows of uh, people who engage in binary debate are very uh, spatially oriented. Right? They put this argument here and this argument next to it. They put this argument here and that argument. And then they flip a page for the new set of arguments and put them there. And, and they even use language like, I'm going to have one off and then Topic Kelly, what was it? Uh, I can't do it. Eight off. Huh? Eight off. I owe this person X because they did this to me. Like how that would fit into arguments, because I think arguments you know, can also be give and take like that. Like we assign this value to this argument, so we think that in order to like pay that back, the other side needs to have X value. There's the theory of argumentation. So if you took my argument class, um, although they all missed it on oh. the, the test. 
Right, there's Wait, a functional, this is my question. <laughs> yeah, the functional component of argumentation does sort of involve that reciprocity where you undertake the burden to prove something true or if pushed to substantiate or defend it, and that compels an auditor to listen to you. Right, you are in a sense risking uh, some of your credibility in exchange to be listened to. Is that the dialectical part or the rhetorical part? That, uh, well, <laughs> it's functional, but more, more along the lines of the dialectic. And, and if you're interested in the connection between reason and the, the social dimensions of human interaction, let me recommend to you a terrific, well, an article in a book. Um, there are a couple of uh, a cognitive psychologists named Mercier and Sperber, uh, and they wrote something recently called, well, recently about the last five years, um, called The Argumentative Theory of Reason. And it's really fascinating stuff. It's kind of turned the world of cognitive psychology on its ear, at least the, the portion of the world of cognitive psychology that studies human reason. Um, and they're, it's different from this stuff, but there are some connections. <clears throat> Their complaint was that, on the one hand, we seem to venerate human reason as this most important and distinguishing feature of human cognition. Differentiates us, our ability to do so at these high abstract levels, differentiates us from all of the creatures that exist. That's great. The problem is we do it really poorly. With regard to employing reason to make decisions, human beings tend to employ it really poorly. And broadly, they say there are two problems that we have with the way in which we reason. Human beings are lazy when it comes to reasoning. That is, when we are asked to make decisions, we tend not to engage the process of reasoning because it's tough. We tend to react by gut or we tend to react by precedent, what we've done before. And that if we're not challenged and we're asked to solve a problem, we tend not to engage reasoning, but we tend to do it, we tend to do it just by intuition, by gut. They also say that, and this is one you're probably more familiar with, one of the problems of human reasoning is that we tend to be very biased. That when we are trying to evaluate competing positions, we tend to preference that evidence that confirms what we already believe rather than paying more attention to evidence which is contrary to what we already believe. So they say these two problems are endemic to conceiving of human reasoning as a, as a cognitive skill, an individual cognitive phenomenon. That if it is so important, if it is what distinguishes us, if it is what gave us evolutionary dominance over everything else, it's surprising that we are so bad at it. This is their starting point. Their thesis then was that instead of thinking about human cognition as an individual cognitive phenomenon, we should think of it as a social phenomenon. The human reasoning doesn't occur unless we get into arguments with each other. Quite literally, it doesn't happen. And so their whole premise is that we've been thinking about reasoning wrong all this time, and we've been un inaccurately condemning it as flawed. Because biased and lazy is a problem when you think about it as an individual cognitive skill. Those bugs actually become features when you think of it as a social phenomenon. You're lazy as a reasoner because you wouldn't unnecessarily expend energy thinking about things unless you were challenged. Unless there were somebody there arguing with you, you wouldn't engage in that process of actually coming up with reasons for things. Only when somebody puts pressure on you and challenges you would you do so. And your bias is actually a feature if you think of human reasoning as a social phenomenon because you are more attentive to evidence that bolsters your case, that makes your argument stronger so you can offer it to another person. So human reasoning isn't something that happens in your head, it's something that happens when you interact with somebody else. Right? Fantastic stuff. Their book is called uh, The Enigma of Reason. Well worth the read, fascinating stuff. But it kind of gets at that same sort of idea that human beings don't exist as individual automatons. We exist only in context with others. And that social exchange that we have according to Mercier and Sperber, is the very basis of human cognition. Right? We are a collective. A person by themselves is not a person. Fascinating stuff. Yes? So, when you're talking about displacement, yeah. like the way that you have backed up in the debate is through like framing, right? That's the words I don't like. What does framing mean okay. to you? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I mean, that's the only like, thing. Like, like talking about the relative importance of issues, talking about like, comparatively, like what is more important in terms of the debate, the actor, things like that. Like, sure. what are the priorities and incentives? Yep. Um, in your book, you talk about framing as being something that you do prospectively or retrospectively. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, like, how, when we're making arguments and employing yeah. displacement within the arguments, rather than simply before or after, how we can model that. Thank you. First of all, it's the part of the book I need to rewrite. 
Okay. No, I'm, and I'm absolutely serious. I mean, I, I talked about it in my book. I talked about uh, constructed, deconstructed, and framing. And that's not right. I was wrong about that. Because framing actually is two different things. It's definitional at the bottom of the hierarchy. Oh, it's not. It's definitional at the bottom <laughs> of the hierarchy. That's prospective framing, right? That's saying this is what we're going to argue about. And we can have de arguments about what we're going to argue about, but at some point we have to come to a common understanding of what it is we're arguing about. So that's prospective framing. This is retrospective. Right. This is looking back upon the debate and saying, here's what's more important. Here's why this set of issues or these set of arguments is more important than that set of arguments. So I made the mistake of lumping them together, thinking they were functioning in the same way, but I think they're actually very different skills at different ends of that, different positions on that hierarchy. Does that answer your question? Um, my question was more that like, the language of prospective and retrospective seems to be like based in time. And like when you do it, so at the beginning of an argument versus at the end of an argument, mm. uh, is when you're doing it in the middle of an argument. Like a lot of the best debaters, like a lot of Alaska debaters, mm. women, uh, like will make claims about the definitions and the comparative like in the middle of their arguments rather than simply before or after. Yeah, um, all you can say is generally. Right. Generally, you engage in prospective framing or definitional argumentation at the beginning, so we can set the terms and come to agreement. Generally, you engage in retrospective framing or comparative argumentation near the end of the debate because all of the constructed and deconstructive effort has then been laid out, and now you can look at the big picture. But there are times when it's advantageous to do it in the middle, right? And those are, I would say those are the exception more than the rule, but they're important exceptions. And I don't yet have a real good categorization system for when that's important and when that's not important. I think a more fundamental way to get at it is to develop those skills as prospective and retrospective, and then start to look for opportunities between those two ends where you can apply those same techniques and tactics. Now, that's no, not a very satisfying answer, but it's probably the best I can give you. Yes, sir? Do you have any basic drills that you might suggest to augment and develop your uh, argumentative proprioception? Yeah. Um, start looking at motions and coming up with all the possible issues you can. And that's just, it's the best exercise that I have found to occupy debaters' quiet time on long plane rides to tournaments. <laughs> you give them a list of motions and say, I want you to come up with an issue set for these motions. Because what they start doing then is they start thinking not only about what arguments I would make, boom, there's an issue that comes into being. What arguments I can anticipate from my opposition, well, there's another set of issues that comes into being. But working through that then also gives them the opportunity to phrase those issues well. Have I abstracted them at the appropriate scope and scale such that they're inclusive and distinct? Also gives them the chance to sequence those issues, to start thinking about the logical progressivity of arguments and how you can make your case most compelling by starting at the beginning and progressing toward the end. Um, so I think that is the, the, the best one you can do that kind of gets at this holistic notion of, of proprioception. It's just to spend time working through issues and then comparing them with others, give everybody the same. We do this a lot in our practices where I give groups, three or four groups, the same motion and say, okay, come up with an issue set for this motion. And then we compare them and talk about the differences, which is better, which is worse. So that's a, a really effective one. Because you're also talking about strategy at that point too, right? Where am I gonna put my energy? Um, is, it, is it best for me to concede this, foregoing deconstructive argumentation, conceding this argument, but trying to make my other arguments more important? It's true, but it doesn't matter. It's important argumentative approach. Yes, so, an open office hour tomorrow. Yeah, it looks like all your time got I'm excited about that. Come talk to me. I'm, I like talking about debate, so I'm more than happy to come visit me. I'll, if you want to, I'll put together a practice round. I'd love to watch a practice round too. Whatever you want to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a Google Doc. I, Angie left, but y'all signed up on there. I'll be in the squad room. Yeah. Anything else you want me to talk about? No, does anyone else have any questions? Alright, well I think we we're getting to know